from the book of Joshua, chapter 24, beginning with verse 1, the book of Joshua. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. Then Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau I gave the mountains of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. And also I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to what I did among them. Afterward, I brought you out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. So they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. Then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. And they fought with you. But I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land. And I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose to make war against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not let uh, listen to Balaam. Therefore, he continued to bless you, so I delivered you out of his hand. Then you went out over the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you. Also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, but I delivered them into your hand. I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them, and you eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now therefore, fear the Lord, Serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which, you, which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage who did those great signs in our sight and preser preserved us all in all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. As the Lord drove out, the the, uh, out from before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwell in the land, we also will serve the Lord, for He is our God. Let's pray. Father, once again, we honor You and we magnify You as our God. Father, I'm so grateful that you have brought us together, assembled us in this room to come together to worship you, to magnify you, to elevate your son, Jesus Christ. That as we read your word, Father, you speak to us with clarity in our minds. And Lord, I pray that once again, if I have been deemed worthy, I pray that you would use me as a vessel, as an instrument in your hand for the benefit of those who are in this room today. Be glorified as we magnify your son and pray in his name. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray, amen. Amen and amen.
Today, once again, continuing this theme in which I have been over the past number of weeks in a message simply entitled, Failure is Not Final. I had intended to bring a message that would give the inspiration, that it would remind us of that no matter what has happened on, in our lives, that no matter what we have gone through, it, that situation or that circumstance does not have to define who we are today. And we learned through a series of messages that that very thought uh, of, of how uh, these, these words or these scriptures can apply to us. And, and I use the foundation from the book of 1 Corinthians to remind us how uh, the Lord uses all of these ex experiences and all these individuals in the Old Testament to help minister to us where we are even now. In the book of 1 Corinthians, remember chapter 10. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil evil things as they also lusted. It goes on to say, now all these things happened to them as examples to us. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So as we read the Old Testament, we not only read the historical account of the nation of Israel, but we also read examples that are there, that are included in the Word of God that you and I, even today, can receive from, that we can grow from, that we can learn from, understanding what they have gone through, that yet we ourselves can learn and, and quite possibly not find ourselves in similar situations based upon what we have learned through their example. Now, as I read to you these verses in the book of Joshua, there's something that I, that I could not help but see. On numerous accounts, as I read chapter 24 of the book of Joshua, you read, uh, or I read to you, I believe at least four or five instances where it stated what had occurred on the other side of the river, which is defined as we understand it as their wilderness experience. And yet now they find themselves in the land of promise, what, what God had ordained for their lives and what God had told them over and over again, this is what I will do for you. This is what I will give for you. But there is yet a distinction that is made between what they had experienced on the other side of the river and then now being in the promised land. So the distinction is made. And, and once again, as I read these verses, I, I can't help, I often approach it from this perspective. I've said, Lord, as I'm reading these verses, Help me to understand what you want me to see. Help me to learn what you are trying to convey to me that I may in turn convey that to your people. And, and with, with that in mind, as I read those, I couldn't help but, but, but recall or see how there is yet a distinction that is to be made, even in our lives, from where we were in our past experiences to where we are even now. The Jordan River being defined as, as, as that boundary, that place, that circumstance that they had to cross over to get into the promises of God. And you and I today, once again, experience uh, being in covenant with the living God through his son, Jesus Christ. And so now we in, our, in, in turn are experiencing or can experience, as the song said that we sang this morning, the promises of God. So this morning, I, I want to remind you, and I'm going to speak to you from that perspective. Understanding that in the book of Joshua, we, we will encapsulate the, these series, these messages today. We will conclude today. So once again, three, three Sundays ago, I began with the accursed things, conveying the idea, once again, that, that, that oftentimes there are situations in our lives that, that are deemed accursed by the Spirit of the living God. That, that when you and I permit ourselves or allow ourselves to indulge or to delve into or to dive into certain areas that it can hinder what God has ordained for us. And we've been there. How many have ever been in a situation where, you, where for whatever reason you understood and you knew exactly that if you endeavor to do this situation for the living God, then you must separate yourselves from those things that would hinder your progress in God. That, is, that applies to every person in this room. Every person today will have to make that determination of applying or, or, or living their life in accordance with the will of God or allowing situations and circumstances to get in the way. The accursed things. Well, because of what they had done or because of one man's actions, we learned that, that, that their defeat came to the nation of Israel. 
They went to up to battle uh, the, the nation of Ai, and because of their own situations and because of someone had taken of the accursed things, now they find defeat. Believing and understanding that God had led them there and promised that they would have victory, now they find defeat. So the elders in Joshua, they come before the Ark of the Covenant and, and now they fall on their faces and they begin to show all of this negative emotion, negative remorse and repentance. They are not understanding why they are now in defeat. And the Lord himself said these very profound words to Joshua. When he said to him, get up, sanctify yourselves and in essence begin to fight. Gives us the inspiration that every now and then we find ourselves in those types of situations in despondency and despair because of circumstances on this side of heaven. And we don't know why we're there. Maybe because we, we have learned and we've been taught and we, we, we believe that, that, that because we are children of God, that we will never find ourselves in negative situations. Now, in their circumstance, it was because of what they had done or what one man had done. But, but oftentimes in those moments in our lives, we find ourselves in this despondency, in this despair, in this emotion. And we find ourselves oftentimes on our faces or on our knees before the Lord. And there comes a time in our life where I firmly believe that prayer is not enough. That oftentimes we have to get up from our situation. As the Lord said to Joshua, get up and sanctify yourself, Joshua, and the people and fight. Helping us to understand that every now and then, in order for us to get to where God desires for us to be, we have to get up from our circumstances, our gloom and our despair, and determine what we must do in order to overcome those circumstances in our lives. So oftentimes we, we're, we're simply crying out to God, and yes, there, there, there is that element of, of crying out to God, but every now and then as, as the message spoke to us, that they were going to possess the land, and the Lord said to them, I have given you this land, however, they had to take possession. They had to fight. They had to conquer, which gives us once again the idea that, that for us to receive what God has ordained for our lives individually, oftentimes we must fight through the circumstances in life to get to where God desires for us to be. Oftentimes, even in my situations, I come to this understanding that, that in spite of circumstances, I must continue to fight. Do you know how easy it would be for me as a man who is called to preach the word of God to look at numbers and determine whether or not I'm going to proceed in what I've been called to do? The human element will always say, look at the situation. But the spiritual application always says, trust God and have faith. So somewhere along the line, we must exclude oftentimes what we see and hold on to the very promises of God in our situations. Last week, part three, failure is not final. And the idea was, was, was that, that, that there were the kings that came against Joshua uh, because the, the Gibeonites had aligned themselves with Joshua and the nation of Israel. Ultimately, there was confrontation and there was battle and, and those kings fled. They, they, they hid in a cave, and, and eventually, after the defeat of all those, those people, uh, Joshua tells the, the elders to come, and, and, and I want you to, to bring out those kings, and I want you to put your foot on their necks. And then Joshua said, this is what the Lord will do against anyone who you will fight against. Giving us the idea that victory simply will come in situations and circumstances in which we are willing to engage in battle. You see, the imagery or, or, or the analogy was, was in it, with those words rendered, against whom you fight, which gives once again the inclination that, that if, if you're not willing to fight against that challenge, if you're not willing to fight against that giant, if you're not willing to fight against that circumstance, if you're not willing to fight against that king that has been raised in your life to defeat you, then you might not ever have victory. That's the imagery. Put your neck, hey, foot fit on the neck. And this is what the Lord, notice what he said. This is what the Lord will do against all of your enemies against whom you are willing to fight. Once again, that gives us the idea that, that, that things just don't happen spontaneously oftentimes in our lives. That we have to be willing to engage in battle. 
So for that person today that is here and under bondage to certain things, you're under, uh, uh, you're, 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 you're being challenged by circumstances or life in and of itself is overwhelming. I'm here to tell you at some point in time, we have, we must get rid of the accursed things. We must get up from our situations. We must sanctify ourselves and we must be willing to fight. And against whom we are willing to fight, we can have victory. We can have victory. We can have victory on this side of heaven. No one in this place has to remain under bondage. No one in this place has to, be, has to live a life that you're being overwhelmed by situations. Why? Because the Bible very clearly says, this is what the Lord will do against all of your enemies in which you are willing to fight. So this morning, if you're here today and there's a situation and a circumstance in your life that is overwhelming you, that you feel as though you're being defeated in that situation, I'm going to ask you this question, to, or, or, or have you done these things in which I've stated to you? Have you identified that situation? Have you acknowledged that circumstance? Have you now developed a determination to gain victory against that circumstance? Now, are you willing to get rid of that accursed thing? Are you willing to stand up and, and sanctify, dedicate, commit yourself unto the purposes of God? Are you willing to fight that situation that's come against you? on this side of heaven. That's only for you to, to, to ponder whatever that might, might be in your life. But I, I've come to the realization that it, it not only applies to you, it applies to me, it applies to all of us. For I, I'm convinced that most of us at some place in our life, at some point in our life, we come against these situations, these circumstances that are here, rendered according to the word of God. The book of Joshua is a book of conquest. A book of, of, of seeing how when the people commit themselves wholly and dedicate themselves totally to the things of God, that they can receive the promises of God. And, and once again, we've heard those words this morning. And I, I don't know if there's anyone here today that is, that is willing to wait on the promises of God. Is there anyone here this morning that, that believes with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, that God has promises for you on this side of life? Is there anyone here? I see hands. I see some hands that just went up. According to the word of God, we'll see. Now, I read to you Joshua chapter 24. For it is in Joshua 24 that we see the culmination of this entire book. The book of conquest. The book of victory. The book of receiving the promises of God. They were commissioned. They were told. They were mandated to go into this land. The land that flows with milk and honey. The land of the promises of God. And they were to, to in essence, fight against the inhabitants to overwhelm the inhabitants, to overtake the inhabitants, to destroy the inhabitants in order to receive the very best of the things of God. Now, I've said to you this many, many times that in the word of God, there are oftentimes types and shadows. Uh, there are circumstances that will once again remind and become examples to us. And so oftentimes uh, we see these types of situations and, and when we see how, how they were commissioned to once again destroy all of the inhabitants, of the land of promise. So once again, that gives us the idea that in order for you and I to, to, to live in this place of victory, to, to receive the very promises of God, that you and I are commissioned, commanded, mandated to rid our lives of anything that would come against the purposes of God in our lives. That, 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 that is the message that you'll find in these verses of Scripture, uh, in, in the book of Joshua. So, so right now, if, for, for your sake right now, I would like for you to identify in your own mind anything that could be of, of, of this circumstance in your life, something that would hinder your progress, something that would keep the promises of God away from your, your, from your experience, something that would cause you to, to remain on the other side of the, the Jordan River and never into your, into your land of promise. What could it be? Only you know what it is for you. And if you can identify that, the question would be, what have you done? What will you do about that situation? Because let me give you some scriptures and help you to understand where I'm going with this. They were told to, once again, destroy all of the inhabitants, men, women, children, oftentimes beasts and possessions. Everything is to be destroyed. But let me read to you a few verses. After they now have begun to possess the land, some verses that I want you to see. 
Because here I understand that the, the defeat of all these nations, remember, was determined by uh, following the ark of God, walking in total faith, uh, abiding in the covenant relationship with God, being obedient to the command of the Lord, not just uh, doing what they felt they needed to do, but often in obedience they would receive victory. They would gain victory. So now once again, in the wilderness for 40 years, now they're possessing the land. And for the next five years, uh, the nation of Israel would be enter into battle to possess the promises of God. You see, oftentimes it doesn't happen on their turn or on our terms. They, 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 would they have thought that it would take them that long to possess their land? Well, once again, people of God, every now and then we have an inclination that this is how long it's going to take in order for us to receive what God has for us. I'm here to tell you, we simply don't know. The, the, the reality of the matter is that we must continue to move forward. We must continue to fight. We must be, continue to be determined that we're going to do what we're called to do in spite of situations. Now, let me show you what happened in the book of Joshua, chapter 15. Because now they're possessing the land and, and it's time to distribute the land to the, 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 all, all of the people and all the tribes of the nation of Israel. For now they come as, as a nation to the land of Israel, to the land of Canaan, to the land that flows with milk and honey. And it's going to be distributed to the different tribes. In Joshua 15, you can read it for yourself. I'm just going to read to you a few verses from, from these chapters because I want you to see what happens here. Joshua 15, verse 63. As for the Jebusites... The inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. Remember, they were commissioned. They were mandated. They were commanded to drive out the people, the inhabitants. But in Joshua chapter 15, it says that this did not happen. In Joshua 16, verse 10, goes on to say, and they did not drive out the Canaanites who dwell in, dwelt in Gezer. But, all the, but the Canaanites dwell among the Ephraimites to this day and have become forced laborers. So now once again, commissioned and mandated to, to, to drive them out. Joshua 16, 10. They did not drive out the Canaanites. In Joshua 17, verse 12. Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities. But the Canaanites were determined to dwell in the land. And it happened when the children of Israel grow strong that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they not, did not utterly drive them out. You, you'll continue to see this theme in these verses. In Joshua chapter 18, verse 1. Now the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together in Shiloh. And they set up a tabernacle meeting there, and the land was subdued before them. But there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. And listen to what Joshua says. Then Joshua said to the children of Israel, How long will you neglect to go and possess the land which the Lord your God, the God of your fathers, has given you? Pick out from among you three men from each tribe, and I will send them, and they will shall rise and go through the land, survey it in accordance with their inheritance, and come back to me. So, so now they have entered into the land of Canaan. They're possessing the land. They're being given the land but they're not doing exactly what they were commanded to do. There were some who did not even pursue after what was going to be rightfully theirs. And once again, you see the message. You see, you see how it aligns even with our lives individually. That if we use this as a spiritual application, there might be times in our lives where we find ourselves in this situation that in spite of being commissioned to get rid of that situation, to, to, to rid yourself of that accursed thing, to, to not do this, or, or to get rid of all of the opposition, or to fight against anything that would come against you as a Christian today. We often find ourselves just in this circumstance. The children of Judah could not drive them out. The children of Christ, the followers of Christ, could not drive out that habit, that, 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 that bondage. That problem, that situation. Uh, no, no, notice what it says. They did not drive out the Canaanites. They did not drive out the opposition. They did not drive out or get rid of that situation in their life that would hinder them, that would prevent them from experiencing the very best of God. You see it over and over and over again in the Word of God. So once again, I've come to the realization that, that, that not only are the promises made from the living God in which we serve, not, not only are they available to every person who will respond, 
But there's a, a very important element that must be understood. That oftentimes, without the conditional response on our behalf or what we do, we will never experience the very best of what God has ordained for our lives. Very simple message, very, very simple application. But the question is, where do we find ourselves individually? See, that, that, that's why we, we bring to you, I bring to you these messages or, or the word of God. Not, not in once again, and I've said this numerous times, not, not, not just to entertain you or, or not just to occupy your time, but, but I'm convinced that as we apply the word of God to our lives, it makes a difference in our lives. It changes our lives. It changes circumstances in our lives. Question is, what do we do? Do we read it? Do we receive it? Or do we simply want to apply it and make it real in our own lives? So, so with that in mind, I, I, in order for me to understand or, or to give you a, an adequate impact in terms of, of what I'm trying to do this morning, for the sake of this message entitled, Choose You This Day Whom You Will Serve. Uh, as we bring together or bring to a close these messages from the book of Joshua in this particular series, I want you to understand that there are those that are many, many individuals in the nation of Israel who found themselves in the manner in which I just described. But we also come to the realization that this morning, for the sake of this message, I want to highlight two individuals that will give you a different perspective of the norm. Two people that, that looked at circumstances differently than everyone else. Two people that because of their circumstances and, and their belief and their faith in the living God were able to experience the very promises of God in spite of everyone else falling short. Let me explain to you what happened. In the book of Numbers, you'll go, I'm going to take you back now to the conquest of the nation of Israel. Uh, to the conquest of, of, of God, uh, the promised provision of the land that God had given to, to Israel. But it all began, remember, in the book of Numbers. For then we see how God had, 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 had delivered his people from the bondage in which they had found themselves for over 400 years. And let me read to you these verses from the book of Numbers, chapter 13. Notice what it says in verse 26. You don't have to turn there. Uh, Numbers 13, chapter 26. And they, and they went and came to Moses and Aaron. Now, remember, they had now been delivered from Egyptian bondage. And now the opportunity to possess the very promises that God has made to them. And they came and went and came to Moses and to Aaron. And to all the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh. And brought back word unto them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we came unto the land whither thou sent us. And surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So here now, once again, we know the account. We know how Moses sent out these 12 spies, and, and now they come back and they bring this report. But something happened here. Now, as they begin to share, yes, yes, we saw the, all of the opposition. We saw the, the, the giants. We saw walls that are so high, and they looked at it from that perspective that there's no way we're going to be able to conquer this land. Not, not remembering what, what God had already done, not remembering how God had delivered them from Egyptian bondage, and now they see their situations, and they see their circumstances. But the Bible tells us of one man who came with a different perspective. It goes on to read, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up, to a uh, uh, go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. One man, his name was Caleb. Notice what happened. But the men that went up with him said, we will not be able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched uh, unto, unto the children of, of Israel saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up its inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in are, are men of great stature. And there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, and which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. So there was a perspective. Now, once again, we've learned 
that this is not a, an analogy. This is not a metaphor. That this is history. That this is a real account of God's people now searching the land and seeing men and, and what, what we've come to know as giants. Now, it's real. We see that it's real. But the majority of those people saw the situations. They saw the opposition. They saw the problems. They saw the circumstances. And based upon they saw what they saw, they, they said, there's no way that we can ever possess the land. But we know what happened. Here was now a man by the name of Caleb. And we learn and see what happens. Now, the, the, the people, they see the circumstances. They, they, they see what, what's, what's there in opposition to them. And, and the Bible tells us what, what occurred. Because now here come two men, Caleb and Joshua, with a different perspective, with a different attitude. There were 12 spies. And they, they all saw the same situation. They all saw the same circumstances. But two men, by faith, trusted God and based their trust on his promises and saw the land as theirs. Two men. Two men. Two, two men uh, that did not trust in themselves and knew they could not defeat the Canaanites, but they trusted in the living God. There were, there were 10 men that did not, see, did not trust in the promises of God. Two men that trusted in God. Understand, people of God, you see the, you see the distinction, you see the delineation that, that it was there. Uh, understanding the 10 men that said, we can't do it, there's no way. Two men that said, we can do this, we can do this. And understanding that both of them were right. You see, the 10 men that said, we cannot do this, we cannot defeat, were right. On their own accord, they could not win. In their own battles, they could not win. But they forgot that they were in covenant with the God of the universe. They forgot that they were in, once again, in, in unity with the God of all creation. And because God was there, they could have victory. Instead, they looked at their, searchers, their situations and their circumstances. But then there were two men. Two men who were willing to get, let God use them. Two men. Two men that in spite of the opposition, in spite of the circumstances, we're willing to say that we know that we can take the land, that we can take possession. Why? Because we know the God that we serve. Two men uh, who oppose, understand that two, the 10 men that were opposed to God's will and hindered others. And there were two men who rejoiced in what God was about to give them. Why? Because they trusted and they believed in the God that they served. I say all of that to you today, this morning. Because you and I can find ourselves on one side or the other. We can live our lives today and look at our situations and look at our circumstances and look at our challenges and look at the walls that are too high and the giants that are too big in our lives. And we can say, there's no way we're going to make it on this side of life. We can be in that group or we can be in, the, in, in line or in league with these two men who saw the situations, who saw the circumstances, and in spite of anything that they saw and witnessed, believed on the promises of God. I don't know where you are today. I don't know where you find yourself today. But even today, we can make that distinction. We can make that choice. We can make, we, we can make that determination today. Listen, we can leave out of this place today determined that no matter what happens or not, no matter what is in opposition to us or not, no matter what occurs, that in spite of the situation, that because we are in covenant with the living God, that we can have victory on this side of life. We can walk out of here just knowing in confidence and boldness that we are children of the living God. Or we can walk out of here and say, does, my life is all messed up. I have too many problems. I'm never going to do this. I'm never going to have that. I'm never going to reach this because the situation in my life are too big. It is up to you to determine how you will walk out of this building today. Look at what happened. In Numbers chapter 14, and all the congregation, congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle meeting before all the children. There were 10 men that murmured, that denied God. There were 10 men that could, did not believe in the, the God's ability to see them through. Just days away, once again, from their intended location of habitation. They're just days away from their promised land. And they forgot all that God could do and all that he had already done. And now in their situation, because there were two men, Joshua and Caleb, who came with a different perspective. Now, the Bible says, all the congregation wanted to stone them with stones. Notice what happens. In Numbers chapter 14 says they wanted also to kill Joshua and Caleb because they wanted to follow the Lord. Now, people of God, let me share with you this. 
Right now, you and I, once again, have the ability to determine on which side we will stand right now. In spite of your, the opposition in your life, in spite of the problems, in spite of your trials, in, in spite of your past, you have to determine and I have to determine right now what will be our perspective. Here there were two different perspectives. We can't. The walls are too high. The giants are too big. We can't do this on our own. And yes, they were right. They could not do it on their own, but, but they forgot and were not remembering that they had God on their side. Notice what happens once again. It was stated, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and he will give it to us. It says, neither fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Perspective of Caleb. Perspective of Joshua. Once again, where are we? Where do we stand? What do we do? In Numbers chapter 13, once again, it says this. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites dwell by the sea. Then Caleb once again quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. What is our perspective today against the challenges in life? against your circumstances. Will you forever be defeated because those circumstances seem too large or too big? Or can you believe in your heart, in your own spirit, that because God is on your side, you can take possession of the promises of God? Only you know where you stand. Only you know. Two attitudes, once again, we can do it. Uh, uh, we can do it, we can do it, why? why? Why can we do it, Joshua, Caleb? Why can we do it, Caleb? Why, why can we do it, why? Because he is with us. Do you understand, people of God? Once again, I've said this so many times in our, in our existence, in our, in our being coming together, that we are not alone. Do you understand that we as children of God, if you're genuinely a child of God, the spirit of the living God lives within you. We are not in this alone. Why? Because he is with us. He is with you. He, listen, let me see. Is, how, how many of today say, I know that I know that I know that I'm a child of the living God, that I am in communion with the living God, that I serve the living God. If that is you, remember, he is with you. He's with you. The other attitude, no, we can't. Too big, too many challenges. Remember, these are the covenant people of God. These are the people that God delivered out of Egyptian bondage. They were in covenant with the living God. No, we can't. Why? We, everything's too big. We saw the giants. We, we see the problems. Uh, we, listen, God has destined us for a land that flows with milk and honey, but there's too many obstacles in my life. There's too many problems in my life. And, and even today, the Bible, in the, the Bible tells how they murmured and they complained, but that happens today. So many Christians today not understanding the promises of God, not understanding that they're in communion with the living God, if they're genuinely in communion with the living God, not understanding that if he has called them to a place in their life, that if they just remain faithful and obedient and get rid of things that would hinder their progress, that they can gain victory on this side of life. But what happens instead? Most, most even today, even today, Christians who say, oh, look at my life. Oh, look at my problems. Oh, today with social media, you can know everyone's problems instantly. You can know how they're feeling in a moment in time. Because of social media, even believers today express all of this negative emotion, all of the negative dreams, all of their negative aspirations, all of the negative not believing in the promises of God. Why? Because I believe they're forgetting that he is with them. So what do we see? In this situation, you begin to see the attitudes, the perspectives. I don't want to stay there too long. I, I, I want you to understand this morning, in essence, the very thing that I'm trying to convey to you this morning. You see, because of all of that, that had occurred, the Bible tells us what happens. Now, 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 because of the challenges, now because of their perceived circumstances, the Bible tells us in number 14 what occurred. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, oh, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt or would God that we had died in the wilderness and wherefore has God brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey. 
Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. We were learned just recently in the past couple of weeks how when Israel was defeated at Ai, Joshua had this perspective. Oh, that we would have been content to stay and remain on the other side of the Jordan. Here you see how it occurred with the entire nation. Oh, if we would, here they were, the people lifted up their voice. They cried, they wept. The people murmured against Moses and Aaron. They grumbled, they complained. Oh, would God, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, if only we had died in the wilderness, why has the Lord God brought us to this land to die and our wives become prey? Would it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Let us return to Egypt. So there they were, forgetting the promises of God, forgetting the provision of God, Forgetting the power of God. Forgetting the promises of God. So that was their mindset. That, that, that was their perspective. But we know what goes on to happen. We know what occurs. How they all, because of this situation, because of their circumstances, they would now have to wander in the wilderness. But I remind you that there was Joshua and there was Caleb. Caleb. Two men that in spite of their situations believed on the promises of God. Remember, Caleb previous, previously said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. Oh, people of God, I'm here to tell you, I, I, I don't know about you, but once again, I'm in communion, I'm in, I'm in conversation, I'm in dialogue with numerous people, even in the household of faith. And more often than not, instead of having this mentality that we can do it, I can make it. I'm a child of God. I'm in covenant with the living God. He has promises for me. And if I align my life with his life, doesn't matter what I see right now, that I can make it on this side of heaven. Instead of that perspective, oh no, my life is a mess. Lost all hope. Don't know what's going to happen in their lives, even as covenant children of God. But there was Caleb and there was Joshua. Using these words, listen, I wanted you to get these words because I, I want you to make this personal right now. I, I say to you, how can this impact your life? How, how can this make a difference in your life by you making it personal? By making it seem as though these words are being spoken directly to you, for you, by you, and into the promises of the living God. Only you can do this in your life. Here's the perspective in your situation, in your circumstance. Make it personal. If the Lord delight in me, then he will bring me into this land and he will give it to me. A land which flows with milk and honey. You make it personal. Only I must not rebel against the Lord. You make it personal. I must not fear uh, the people of, of the land. I must not fear my situations for they are bred for me or my, my situations, I can overcome them. Their defense is departed from them. That situation will have no victory. Why? Because I am a child of God. Listen, and, and the Lord is with me. The Lord is with me. I will fear not them. I will not fear. I will not fear. Why? Because the Lord is with me. I will not look at my life as a failure. I will not look at my life as I'm always going to be, be defeated. I will not look at my life as I have no promises for, from God. Why? Because I am a child of God. The perspective that we must develop, that we must possess. Remember, there was Caleb and there was Joshua. But because of all the complaints, we know what happens. The Lord says this, and the Lord said in Numbers 14, I have pardoned according to thy word. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Let me say that one more time. I believe that's relevant today. But as truly as I live, says the Lord, the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten, 10 times and have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. But then he says these, these words. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit within him and has followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein to he went and his seed shall possess it. See, the Lord says, because you did not believe, because you don't remember what I've done 
because you did not recall how I delivered you and you were set free. And you don't, don't remember any of those things of what I did, all the miracles and, and what I did when in Egypt, in the wilderness, because you don't remember. None of you will experience the very thing that I have promised you. Two perspectives. The Bible goes on to say, the carcasses of all you all who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number. Notice what he says from 20 years old and above. So of all the people that were delivered from Egypt because they did not have faith, because they did not believe on the promises of God, because they did not understand that God would see them through, the Bible says that the Lord himself said that anyone over the age of 20 would not enter into the promised land. But he goes on to say, but your little ones, which you have said would be victims, I will bring them in, and they shall know the land which you have despised, he goes on to say, and his children, I am given the land on, on which he walked because he wholly followed the Lord, understanding except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. Two perspectives. And there was Joshua and there was Caleb. Now, there was Caleb in that circumstance, in that situation. But I also want you to understand what happens. Because now, once again, they begin to possess the land. Now we come all the way to Joshua, the 14th chapter. And I want you to hear what happens. In Joshua chapter 14, listen to what it says in verse 1. These are the areas with the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, Joshua, the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed as an inheritance to them. Remember now, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, they're possessing the land of promise. They're possessing the land. Five years now they've been in battle. Five years they've been trying to overtake. They've been conquering the land. They've not done it to the extent in which they were directed to. However, but what, this is what you'll see. Now, the Bible says their inheritance was by lot. And the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine tribes and a half tribes. For Moses had given the inheritance of two tribes and a half a tribe on the other side of the Jordan, but to the Levites, he had given no inheritance. Understand, let me give you, let me give you this principle that we res I just read to you. The Bible says very clearly, as it states here, that the inheritance of two and a half tribes on the other side. There were two and a half tribes that came to Moses and said, we're content right where we are. We know the promised land is on the other side of the Jordan, but we're content right where we are. Can we stay right where we are? Moses goes on and tells them, if you fight with us, if you conquer the land, then you can come back and you can have this land in which you desire. Do you know what that tells me? That tells me that even as children of God, that though there are promises uh, uh, that, that, that God has made to us, that you and I have to determine, do we want them? You see, they had the opportunity to, to dwell in the land of promise, but instead, what did they do? They chose what they felt was better for them. That gives me the idea that once again, there will be those people who will never experience what God has ordained for them because they're content right where they are. I don't know about you, people of God, but can, can, anyone, can anyone attest this to this in my life? I don't know about you, but I want the very best of what God has ordained for my life. I want to experience the very promise, the very reason why I have been born, the very reason why I have been called, the very reason why God uses or chosen to use me. I want the very best of what God has for me. Is there anyone here that says, I want that in my life? You have to make that determination. Do you want the land of promise or do you want to remain right where you are? Every person, listen, every person, every Christian, Every person that calls himself Christian must make that determination. Do I want what God wants for me or do I want what I want for myself? Notice what happens. Now we come to Joshua chapter 14. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal. Look at what occurs. Then Caleb and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite said to him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And brought, I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Understand, from, from that, notice what he says in verse 8. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely, 
The land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. Now remember, 40 years, all that time, where, where he, now here was Caleb who was promised to possess a land. And he said, and these 40 years and five years, ever since the Lord spoke this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day four score and five years old. Caleb came onto the scene at the age of 40. For 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. For five years, they were possessing the land. Now, at the age of 85, here comes Caleb, and he says this, as yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. And my, as my strength was then, even so my strength is now for war, both to go out and to come in. And he makes this, this command, now therefore give me this mountain. You see that? A man 85 years old saying, I'm as strong as now as I was then. I have lived and waited on the promises of God. I have been faithful. I have believed. I have trusted. I have had faith. For 40 years, I wandered in the wilderness. For the past five years, I have been possessing the land. And now I want the promises of God that he has made, that Moses has made to me. So give me this mountain, says Caleb. He wanted it. He desired it. I believe that his heart became set on the promised land. A man of faith. A man that did not look at the problems. A man that did not look at the challenges. A man that did not look at the giants or the walls. A man that did not look at any of those circumstances, but believed on the promises of God. And now the promises were made that he would have his promised possession. So there for the next 40 years, 45 years, he thought about the promises of God. That was where his heart was destined. That was, his destiny was there, and so was his heart. He had to wander all those times, yet he held on to the promises of God for 45 years. I don't know how long you and I would be willing to wait and hold on to the promises of God, but if we walk in faith, people of God, if you walk in obedience, people of God, if you stand on the promises of God and you don't look at the challenges and you don't look at the problems and you don't look at the trials, but in spite of all of that, you said, God is faithful for I serve a faithful God. I serve a God of promise. And you continue to be committed to what God has ordained for you. You and I, just like Caleb, can get to that place where we can say those words. Now give me this mountain in my life. How many want that? Now they possess their land. Now, Caleb says, it was promised to me, and I want it. Today, I'm standing on those promises of God even in my life. I'm not letting circumstances deter me. I'm not letting situations tell me that once again, I don't, I'm not going to develop this failure mentality. No, no, I'm going to stand on the promises of God. And to what someone else may deem as being, failure, being a failure or not being successful, I'm going to say, I'm going to stand on the promises of God. I will not let anyone determine whether or not I am walking in obedience to the things of God. And I'm going to stand on the promises of God. There was Caleb. Now I want you to see. And learn some areas of the man that we've come to know as Joshua. So I want you to see and understand exactly how this pertains to this man named Joshua. I'm convinced today, people of God, in my mind, that God has a promised land for every person in this room. The very reason why he's led you to this place, and I'm gonna say that literally and figuratively in your life. I want you to look back at your life even now and take into account everything that you've gone through, all the ups and all the downs, all the successes and all the failures. All the promises that seem as though you, you'll, you'll never experience those situations. Maybe even all the heartbreak and all the wilderness situations in your life. And I want you to remind yourself today 
that if you are genuinely a child of God, His promises are yet for you. Understand what's happening here. So often it's so easy for us to understand and recognize the situations that occur in our lives. We're overwhelmed by circumstances. We're overwhelmed by situations. But remember, even in the Word of God, the book of Joshua is a book that reminds us that we can conquer, that we can have victory, that we don't have to be defeated. And I want you right now to, to look at those areas in your life where you find is a challenge for you, where you find as though you're going through a situation that maybe you don't deserve, or maybe for whatever reason you find yourself there. And, and just like Caleb, had that determination, that tenacity in your own spirit to say, in spite of what I find myself in, I'm going to trust on the promises of God, whatever it may be in your life. That was Caleb. But remember, there was also Joshua. I'm going to share with you just briefly through the life of Joshua what we have learned over the past few weeks. Remember, Joshua was elevated to a place of leadership because Moses, the servant of God, had died. Joshua did not apply. Joshua in no way sent in his resume to say, God, I can lead your people. No, he was selected. He was chosen directly by God. And that's what I've come to the realization is that oftentimes in the kingdom of God, it's not that we deem ourselves as qualified. It's that God himself has been observing. He knows us individually. And he selects us based upon his perspective and his perception and his destiny for our lives. I don't deserve to be up here. I don't deserve to be used of God. I, I don't deserve in any way to be, have been selected that God would prayerfully anoint me to minister his word. I don't deserve it. But in spite of myself and in spite of my situation and in spite of my shortcomings and my weaknesses, yet God selected me. I know I don't deserve it. But here was Joshua who was identified as a man that God would use to lead his people to possess their promised land. Over and over and over again, God told him, the Lord said to him, be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. Joshua, there's going to be some challenges. There's going to be some things that you're going to go through. But Joshua, you have to be strong and have courage. And so he says to you and to me, you're about ready to possess what God has ordained for you. But you might not see it. You might not understand it. You might not believe in it. But God says to you and to me, be strong and be of good courage. He goes on to lead him and direct him in what he's to do. And if we remember it was through the life of Joshua that we learned a number of things. I'm going to give them to you, if I can, through the life of Joshua. You see, it's through the life of Joshua in this book of Joshua that we learn how we can be successful ourselves even now, how we can receive the promises of God, how, how to be successful and have the assurance of God. It's in the book of Mo Joshua that, that Joshua is told to meditate on the word of God, to meditate. It means to, to ponder, to study, to mutter, to talk about. So, so once again, for you and for me, once again, for, for those of us who never take the time to open up the book, for those of us who never take the time to open up your app, whatever, for those of us who, 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 are, who never get into the Word of God, we are, we are eliminating the very situation, the very circumstance in our life that it helps us to get to this place to be successful as followers of Christ on this side of heaven. Why? Because we do not meditate on the Word of God. I'm convinced that it's not enough, people of God, to just come on Sunday morning. It's not enough to just come on Sunday morning and, and, and join Zoom on Wednesday night. It's not enough. We're to learn the Word of God. We're to meditate on the Word of God. We're, we're to get it into our heart that we can use it as a weapon of our warfare when it is necessary. It is through the Word of God that, and meditating that we can find the greatest uh, elements of our Christian success. Meditating on the Word of God. 
so many times in my life. Once again, I'm in a place right now, and one of the reasons why next week the writing is on the wall is we're so close to the judgment of God on this side of life. But what I've learned is that there are times, even in my personal situations, because let me say this to you. If I was to give you my own reason and my own mentality because of what I felt that God had ordained for my life for us collectively, we would be a lot farther than where we are even now. I know that the church has been attacked by circumstances over the past year and a half, deliberate attacks by the system to destroy the church. Whether or not you acknowledge it or admit it, it is part of the agenda to get rid of the church of God. We are experiencing the ramifications of that situation. That is the reality of the moment of the day. In spite of those moments in my life and because of those moments in my life, that's when I must gravitate to the Word of God and meditate on the Word of God. It helps me get beyond any reason. It helps me get beyond any doubt. It helps me get beyond any semblance of unbelief. Why? Because I'm meditating on the Word of God. Once again, if you're being defeated today, if you cannot gain victory on situations or in situations in your life, I want to just encourage you to begin to meditate on the Word of God. Now, because of this situation and the life of Joshua, there's a number of things that we've learned. It is through Joshua that we'll learn the greatest keys to success as Christians, as followers of Christ, is through faith and obedience. We learn that from Joshua. Faith and obedience. They come to conquer Jericho, and they're told what to do. And they're to do exactly as they were told to do. And that is exactly what they did. So they gained victory. So it is with us. Victory in our lives is not determined by simply call, cl claiming ourselves as followers of Christ or, or, or claiming the label. It's not even victory that's not guaranteed by just simply walking through the doors. Good, listen, victory is not guaranteed by, by, by even listening to the, the most recent Christian music or whatever the case may be. That, that is not guarantees victory in our lives. What guarantees victory or what can lead us into a place of victory is faith and obedience to the things of God. We see that through Joshua. Another element that we'll learn, another principle that we'll learn through Joshua is that often the promises of God for our lives come after we determine to overcome any obstacle. In other words, if God has ordained this in your life or my life, and instead we see obstacles and problems, things that cause us to miss the mark of God, once again, we can be content with our situations. We can have that woe is me mentality. I'm never going to progress. I'm never going to get better. My life is never going to change. Or we can be determined that oftentimes we must determine, be determined to overcome any obstacle that would prevent us from experiencing what God has for us. That, that, that's a personal matter that we all have to determine. So this morning, once again, if you have obstacles, if you have problems, if you have giants in your life, if you have walls that are too high to get over, you have to be determined today that you must, this today, you must determine to overcome whatever that situation is in your life. You can have that attitude as the 10 spies and say, we can't, we won't, never, it's not going to happen. Or you can say, no, we got this. I've got this because I'm a child of God and he's called me and he's anointed me and he's appointed me and because I'm a child of God, I can make it. I don't care what the obstacles are in my life. I'm going to be successful in the promises of God. We have to determine that individually. So now look at your situations. Look at that problem. Look at that circumstance that you seem as though is going nowhere and say, I can make it because I am a child of God. Through faith and obedience to the things of God, I will overcome in my life. Another area that we've learned from Joshua is that when we obey the command of God, God responds to our obedience. Remember that. 
Oftentimes, it's not just a matter of obeying God, but God will respond in our obedience. Remember, they were instructed how to cross the Jordan. And, and when they obeyed, God responded. Remember, just entering into the promised land. Now there's the Jordan. How can we get to the other side? The promises of God are over. How can we get there? And they were told what to do. And when they did it, in their obedience, God responded. The Jordan began to recede. And now imagine, would you not say what a miracle of God? Now in faith, in obedience, they, they do what they're called to do and they're, what they're told to and the water begins to recede. That is a miracle of God. God responded to their obedience. So what if in our lives, the promises are over there and God says, this is what I want you to do. This is what you need to do. This is what I'm going to lead you to do. Do we once again determine, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to find another way or, or are you going to do it the way God says to do it? God responds to obedience. We learn that through Joshua and what he, what he, what he, what, what occurred. Through Joshua, we learn that in order to experience what God has for us, we must be willing to leave the past, the wilderness behind. Are you listening to me? How many of us today are caught up in circumstances of our past? Let, let's, can, can I just use this? Let, let's pretend like this is the Jordan River right here. But here we are now on this side. And instead of, of, of saying, oh, I don't know if I can make it over there. Why? Because that's an obstacle in my life. Now they obey God. The, the water recedes. And, and now they're able to cross once again on dry ground. They begin to enter their promised land. Now they're here. Now they're entering the promised land. But for many people, once again, it's a matter of wanting to hold on to what is here, what's back here. God has set me free from this situation. God has delivered me from this bondage. God, God has forgiven me of my past. If nothing else, God has forgiven me of my past. I don't have to dwell on who I used to be. All those areas that I blew it and that I messed up now, I've crossed the river. And now, because the river also is an analogy of being in covenant with the living God, now because of what I have done, now I've been forgiven of all of this. And I don't have to dwell in all of this. But too many times, we want to hold on to at least some of this. Through Joshua, we learn that in order to get over here and experience now the distribution of my promises where Caleb can say, give me this mountain. We have to leave all of this behind. Are we willing to do that? That might mean getting rid of some situations that are not becoming of a Christian. That might mean that we have to separate ourselves from situations and circumstances of not being like the world of being different than the world, of getting rid of habits and addictions and all that that we can deliberately and get intentionally put behind us. See, I'm willing to do that because I know that my destiny is not over here. My destiny is over here. So are we willing to do whatever it takes to get over here? Through Joshua, we learn the importance of remembering what God has brought us through. Now they're crossing the River Jordan and, and they establish uh, memorial stones to commemorate how Israel crossed over on, on dry ground. What does that say to us? That says to me that every now and then, when I see situations, when I see challenges, when I see problems, I have to remember what God has already done for me, where he's already brought me from. How many have those places in your life where you can remember what God has already done in your life? How, is there anyone here that can acknowledge and remember all those things that God has set you free from or delivered you from or, or maybe to, transformed you from? Here we're told once again, we're to remember in that regard what God has already done for us. You're lacking faith? Remember what he did to you or for you in your situation when you lack faith. Remember that same God that delivered you then can deliver you now. It's the same God. You have to remember the memorial stones in your life. Through Joshua, we're reminded that we must be and remain in covenant communion with God. 
Remember, they were told uh, the, 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 the ordinance of circum the covenant of circumcision. Now renew the covenant. Now we're told and now we're in covenant with God and now it's time to stay there. Are we children of God? Are we children of God? Are we children of God? Then it's time for you and I to act as though we are children of God and remain in the covenant that we have established with the living God and live our lives in a way that is becoming of children in covenant with the living God. Through Joshua reminded that we must remain in covenant and communion with God. Once again, a number of other verses I, I, I can give you. Uh, it is through Joshua that we see that obedience to the command of the Lord is what shall bring victory in our lives. I've already said that. But that's what it takes. Obedience. Obedience. Now, we get to this place. They begin now to conquer. They've conquered the land. And look at what happens in Joshua chapter 19. When they had made an end to the dividing of the land as an inheritance according to their boundaries and their borders, the children of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua, the son of Nun. According to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city which he had asked for, Timnah, Serah, in the mountains of Ephraim. And he built the city and dwelt in it. So there you see, once again, now here is Joshua, even Joshua, the man who is a man of faith, a man who is a type and shadow or foreshadow of the person of Christ, now he too receives his promised possession. He's Joshua. There's certain men in the word of God that, that the day will come that I, I don't know about you, but I cannot wait to meet some of these people. Joshua, amazing man. Paul, amazing. King David, amazing. But now here is Joshua receiving his land. And to bring it all to a close, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go straight to Joshua 24 as the worship being comes. And if we can do, do it again. Let me read to you these words and I want you to see what happens. Because now we've gone through the book of Joshua. And the Bible tells us these words in Joshua 24. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders. Verse 2, and Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord God, and he begins to give them an account, a history of all that has happened to now get them to their promised land. Because remember, these promises have gone on now for hundreds of years. Huh. And now because of this, remember, God made these promises to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And now here the people have taken possession of the very promises of God. And because of all this, there are situations that he describes uh, that have occurred in their history. And now they, they get to verse this place. And, and he says in verse 13, I have given you a land for which you did not labor. Remember, he's saying to the people, he says, thus says the Lord God of Israel. So it's as though God, the Lord God of Israel is saying this to the people. He's saying, I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. So now because of all of this, Joshua is reminding the covenant people of God that in reality, it is God that gave this to you. He promised it to you. Yes, you had to fight. But remember, there were times that God oversaw the very, even, even the battles in which you were in. So much so that there were times when he sent the hornet before you. And it was through the hornet that it drove them out from before you. He was on to say, all these things I have done, says the Lord. So I want to remind you even now that where we find ourselves today, it's just not because we're willing to fight. It's just not because we don't want to be defeated again in our lives. It's just not because we have aspirations and dreams and, and we want to experience the very best of what God has for me. It's because the Lord himself has given us this land. We had to do our part as he is willing to do his part. So in reality, it's never really about me, never really about us, it's never really about you. 
But in verse 14 of Joshua 24, he comes to this place. He says, now therefore, fear the Lord. And I'm going to make this personal for anyone who wants to experience the very reason why you are alive today. The very promises of God in your life. And I'm talking about in your life. If you believe it. If you feel in any way that these words could apply to you. That God has taken you from the wilderness in your life and now has allowed you to cross the Jordan River. You're in covenant relationship with him and he's leading you into the very promises for which your life has been ordained. I don't know if I'm speaking to anyone today, but I know that I'm speaking to me. Joshua says, thus says the Lord, all these different areas. And now Joshua gets to this place where he speaks to the people. And he says, now therefore, fear the Lord. Reverence the Lord. Honor the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. So once again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reiterate those words to, to, to you, the people of the living God, in this place, in this building, in this sanctuary, even now. Thus says the Lord. He has given us possession of our lands for which we did not labor and cities which we did not build. And we dwell in them. You eat the vineyards and the olive groves which you did not plant. Now therefore, thus says the Lord to you, his people. Fear the Lord and serve him in all sincerity and in truth. No longer play in church. No longer pretending that I'm a child of God when I'm not committed, when I'm not surrendered, when I'm not submitted. Uh, I'm talking about the person who truly yield, willingly yield, yields their life in sincerity and truth to serve and fear the Lord. And then he says this. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Put away the gods. Today, thus says the Lord, for any person within the sound of my voice, if there is anything that is more important to you than Jesus Christ of Nazareth, it's time to put away anything that can elevate and raise itself to a position of lordship in our lives. Thus says Joshua, put away the gods which your father served on the other side. And then he says these words, exclamation, serve the Lord. Did you hear that? Let me make this personal to every person. Every person that's looking at me right now, you're looking at me. Thus says the Lord to you. Thus says the Lord, every person in this place that is not ashamed to call Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Today, we are determined to serve the Lord. Can I get a witness? Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. And he goes on to say this, and I'm going to close with this. There's so much more I could say, but I'm going to stop right here. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, to that person in this place that knows that you're not yielding your life to the Lordship of Christ, to that person who will come and hear these words in the coming days, if you know that you know that you know that you are not serving the living God, in the words of the content of these words, as it may seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Joshua saying to the people, we're gonna serve the living God. 
But if you are not willing to serve the living God in your life, then it's up to you to make the choice and make a determination. So you choose whom you will serve. But then he says this. Whether the gods which your fathers served were on the other side, on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Here we are now in promised possession of the land. There are those who are yet in the land that are serving other gods. Even today, in this life, on this side of heaven, in this world, there are different ways that people are trying to convince the world that they can serve God. I'm here to tell you, people of God, there is one way, and it is found in the book of life. It is found in accordance with the person of Jesus Christ. It's not religion. It's not denominationalism. It's not anything other than serving the living God through His Son. It is through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You make that decision in whom you will serve. And then he says these words. But as for me, says Joshua, and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm not going to determine what's going on outside of these buildings. This is what is building. I'm not going to de- try to determine what's going on even in your home or my home. But when we come together in the household of faith, in the same way that Joshua used those words, I'm here to tell you and to remind you, and prayerfully you will receive this with me. But we in this household of faith, But as for me and this house, we will serve the Lord. Let me say that one more time. As for me and this house, we we will serve the Lord. In spite of the obstacles, in spite of the problems, in spite of the numbers, in spite of who's no longer here, in spite of whatever the case may be, we will serve the living God. We will serve the Lord. We will serve the living God. We will serve the Lord. That's what we'll do. Because the promises of God for our lives are in faith and obedience to the things of God. Not me trying to convince you as long as you come to church, you're going to be fine. I would be doing a disservice to you if that's what I did. But I'm here to remind you. It is through faith and obedience to the things of God that we will experience his very best. Do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want it? Let me ask you one more time. In this house, do we want the promises of God? Whatever you've been through, whatever's happened in your life to get you to where you are right now, God used it all together to get you to be right where you are at this very moment in time. What he's done for you in the past, he will surely do it again. How many believe that this morning? It starts with Jesus. It starts with Jesus. Today, if you allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life, begin to live your life for his glory, repent from all those things that got you outside of the will of God, I'm here to tell you, people of God, that we can enter into covenant promise with the living God. We can serve the King of Kings. And I'm telling you, I feel this in my spirit more and more. The writing is on the wall. Jesus is coming soon. Next week, I'm going to remind you of where we are and how close we are to the return of Christ. I don't know if there's anyone here today that is excited about the fact that one of these days, Jesus is coming back. Come on, somebody. Don't let me be the only one who gets excited that one of these days, Jesus is coming back for us. That Jesus is coming back for us.
See you to win again. 
That's the God that we serve. Come on, people of God. That's the God that we serve. Those situations might not be what we want them to be. He's never failed us yet. That same God is a God that we're in communion with. The same God that we can put our faith and our trust in. Why is that same God that you and I are in covenant with? Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that now? So when you leave this place today, you have the choice. When the battles come in your life, the giants, the walls, whatever they may be, the obstacles, you can say, I'm not going to make it. I can't do it. It's too big for me. I'm overwhelmed by life. Or you can leave this place today and say no and have tenacity like Caleb and Joshua to say no matter what happens in my life, no matter what the circumstances may be, I'm in covenant with the living God. And God is able. God is able. God is able.